Hello, welcome. We will be performing our last lecture regarding about the theoretical study that we have performed before the experimental part of the study. The topics of the, our study will be the determination of the test results in terms of energy components, theoretical study, and the conclusions. The determination of the results in terms of energy components is very important in the current literature because of the importance of the energy terms which will dissipate through the reinforced concrete structures. This issue is highly important in current days for uh, determining the uh, assessment, making the assessment of the structures if they are, uh, well, uh, if they are uh, vulnerable, uh, they will be assessed according to the uh, earthquake behavior. Now let's look at the, uh, first of all, we, uh, we were performing the force-based design before and the second uh, term will be displacement-based design. Actually, these are uh, newly, the, uh, actually the displacement-based design is newly developing the design method. However, the energy dissipation is just composed of the multiplication of the displacement with the force. So, when we come inside uh, all the components, the force and displacement together, we get the energy terms. This energy terms is much more important than those other two ways. To identify if the, earthquake, the uh, reinforced concrete structures are uh, vulner uh, vulnerable and if they, are, uh, if they have good uh, earthquake performance or not. The energy demand and energy-based design is based on the how energy will the construction, will the structure will uh, receive. This, we say that this is the demand of the structure. Because if the structure is soft enough, it, it gets less energy than those the, with stiff uh, structures. So it changes according to the stiffness of the structure. This means that if the period changes, let's see that the lateral uh, axis shows us the period and the vertical axis shows us the input energy which, which is normalized by its mass will give us an idea what kind of, what, what will be the amount of energy that will be imparted into the structure. This issue is very important and the more, the uh, other important point is that how will this energy will dissipate through the structure. Actually, let's say that the energy balance equations could be derived by directly integrating the equation of motion with respect to the response of the system. Actually, this, is, this uh, numerical equation is very uh, famous and uh, it is uh, already applied to existing uh, structures. This is the equation of motion. As we everybody knows that the first term is regarded with the kinetic energy of the uh, system. The second term is regarding with the damping energy of the reinforced concrete structure of a, or a structure. And the third term is the absorbed energy, which includes inside the hysteretic energy and the strain energy. The last term at the right hand side gives us the input energy to the structure. The structure has stiffness and the dashboard here, and uh, when the earthquake hits, there is an acceleration which is imparted to the structure on the story level. Actually, the displacement times this force, means the acceleration force, gives us the input energy. Okay, we can determine how will the energy, uh, how much will the energy will impart it to the structure, but we need to determine these terms one by one to quantify and to understand the energy dissipation mechanisms in the structure. Let's see this in a chart. There's an input energy here. The input energy is divided into two terms, recoverable energy, this is called as stored energy, and the other one is the irrecoverable energy. This is dissipated through the energy. This part is very important because it's, it just re reflects the damages on the structures. 
this is this term the recoverable energy is not related with the damage but this term is re directly related with the damage because there is hysteretic energy here hysteretic energy is composed of many mechanisms which can be said that in a rainfall concrete structure it may be the yielding of the reinforcement the cr cracking of the concrete uh, and the friction of the uh, uh, non-structural and structural elements. These actually, if we increase the part of the damping energy, if we increase the damping energy, we reduce the hysteretic energy. So, we, in the earthquake engineering, and uh, when we make the assessment of the current existing structures, if we increase the additional damping, we directly reduce the hysteretic energy, which means that we will, we will decrease the responsibility of the structural elements. This is very important. Actually, in this part, we say that the infill walls will increase the damping energy of the system and will directly reflect to decrease the hysteretic energy of the reinforced concrete structural elements, which will help the structure to survive from the earthquake loads. As we have told that, this, if we increase the damping energy, the hysteretic energy will be decreased. Then we have to discretize the energy terms in terms of time. Here we, you see the small terms are the strain energy and the kinetic energy. And the second line gives us the damping energy and the third line gives us all the cumulative summation of the strain energy, kinetic energy and damping energy with the hysteretic energy. The, those four terms, when they are added together, they should combine or they should satisfy the input energy. They cannot be bigger than input energy and they cannot be less than input energy. The input energy even in any, anywhere of the structure, it should be dissipated. But as I told you <coughs> one slide ago, if we increase the damping energy, the responsibility of the hysteretic energy or the part of the hysteretic energy will decrease, which will lead us to have less damage during the earthquake. Let's say that what is damping then? The main portion of the input energy imparted to the structure during earthquakes is dissipated through hysteretic and damping energies. So, damping energy is actually the friction between the infill bricks and the crackings through the infill bricks. Those, those are all the terms that we can uh, represent with a damping of the system. We cannot quantify one by one. What the, uh, the friction is different, the cracking is different, the interface between the structural and non-structural elements have also some uh, support uh, to the uh, damping of the uh, system. So we have to quantify an equivalent damping to the structure what, uh, in the same manner that the literature has been doing. That we could derive this kinds of uh, relations between the drift ratio of and the equivalent damping ratio. As you see here, there are some uh, starting points uh, before the 1% of uh, drift ratio is starting with 5% and increasing with the, uh, up to the 15% of the structure. This means that when there is a damage in the system, when there is a damp, uh, friction in the system, the damping energy increases. Actually, there is an uh, elastic part and the inelastic part of the damping energy. First of all, if there is no damage, if the, the, there is no damage, you receive, you can quantify the elastic ener uh, damping. If the uh, dam damage started to propagate, the cracking started to pro propagate, this is the inelastic part of the damping energy. Let's see that in this figure, uh, there we can determine the uh, damping coefficient by a simple method, which has been called as a Jacobsen method, and uh, which has been proposed by Chopra in, its, uh, in, in his uh, book, in a milestone book. He says that the equivalent damping energy 
is the term that the area enclosed by red color divided by with the area enclosed by the triangular shown as the blue area. This gives us an equivalent damping. When there is an uh, the area of the red one is very small, it will directly be the equivalent damping will be small. If the strain energy, which means that the triangular area is small, the damping will be bigger than that. In our studies that we have performed in experimental part, we have performed these kinds of cyclic uh, displacement protocols. This is the displacement and this is the step number. Actually, this seems like a tooth of a saw, uh, but the main idea is that we have to push the specimen to one millimeter and pull the specimen to minus one millimeter. So in order to create an area that is enclosed by the red color that I told you one slide ago, we need to do this kind of displacement. And we receive the force displacement relation like this. This is the force displacement relation derived from the bare frame. There is no infill inside. So as the literature says that you can take 5% of damping in the reinforced concrete structures, that's true. That's what we have proved in our experiments. It's 4.9. It's directly related with the reinforced concrete uh, damping, reinforced concrete members damping in the very elastic part. There is no serious damage. When there is serious damage, the so the uh, damping increases. Actually, we have to understand first the elastic part of the damping. Now, after uh, we have been performing uh, the damping uh, tests, we perform a sinusoidal test. This sinusoidal test also gives us a, a static relation and that, that helps us to understand the uh, red area, to enclose the red area from the test. That's what we have received from the infield test. The infield reinforced concrete structures gives us this kind of force displacement relation. The main idea that we have uh, observed bef uh, before is to quantify the damping by Jacobson method. We derived 13%. As you see here, when there is no infill inside the reinforced concrete frames, we have Determined 5%. In this case, in, with the infill walls inside the reinforced concrete, we received, we determined 13%. This is a very important point to be understood and to be taken into account during the design of the reinforced concrete structures. When we have look out the earthquake areas in, in Turkey, in Düzce, there are a lot of uh, reinforced concrete structures that hadn't been uh, fall down or that, uh, that could survive after the earthquake. What is the reason of that? Because they are also low concrete, reinforced concrete, but they could survive during the earthquake. The main reason is this. The damping was increased almost double, more than double. It was 5% in reinforced concrete, but it is 13% in infill frames. So the infill contributed to the behavior, general behavior of the reinforced concrete structures. They, it cracked, there are crackings, and there are some interaction with the friction. When they are good packaged, they are uh, in the same in-plane air in-plane of the reinforced concrete, they act like a shear wall. After cracking started, they, they start to dissipate the energy. And when they start to dissipate energy, the responsibility of the reinforced concrete structures, reinforced such structural elements decrease. So uh, there is no serious damage in the structural components. But the damage is received by the non-structural components as infill walls. Yes, if we uh, achieve to maintain the in-plane behavior of the infill walls, it is more better for us to, uh, to have a sustainable the ductility and sustainable damping property or sustainable energy dissipation capacity. Here we could understand that if we can package the infill walls in-plane, we could observe about 
12.5, we can say 13% of elastic energy. This is the force displacement relation that we have derived from the retrofitted infill frames. How about the bare frame? We determined all the quasi-static tests, the uh, equivalent damping uh, ratio in the vertical axis. In the lateral axis, there is a drift starting from 5% as the literature advises us. Literature advises us 5% of damping. However, when the uh, drifts, when the damage accumulation increases, the damping increases accordingly. This is for the bare frame case. Infill frame case is di exactly different. As you see here in the graphic, in the infill frame, at least less than half percent of drift. You can observe 10% to 15% damping. In the previous slide, we can see that before the half percent of drift, we could observe 5% of damping. Almost double up in the infill frame. What is the case is if we can determine and if we can uh, sustain uh, the infill walls in the frame, we could uh, achieve at least 2%, uh, uh, 5% of damping into the structure. These are the cross brace frame. The cross brace frame is uh, that we have uh, performed uh, during the uh, tests in the diagonal uh, scheme. The, X type of CFRP sheets were uh, applied. Uh, the diamond cross brace frame is much more uh, effective to uh, keep the infill wall inside the reinforced concrete frame. It is kept in the frame, it is packaged, and if there is no torsional behavior of the structure, there is no out of play moment. If there is no out of play moment, uh, infills will be the very good fuse elements. Even if they are non-structural components, they will act as structural components. They will accumulate and they will support to the structure in terms of energy dissipation. This is the case of our study. Yes, what we have done is uh, performing quasi-static tests uh, didn't, were not enough to uh, quantify the damping because damping is a very variable uh, element, a very variable uh, parameter. This parameter cannot be determined by performing only two or three tests. You should increase too much data and you have to get the average ratio of, the, of those data. This was important for us to determine uh, the damping coefficient of the structures. This is bare frame and this, in this case for the cross brace frame, the equivalent damping versus the, the drift ratio gives us approximately about 10 to 10, uh, 12, 12 to 15, uh, you can say about 13% of damping. In the infield case, this uh, was the similar case. About 14% of damping were derived here, as you see. And in the diamond cross brace type, we can at least we can uh, receive at least 10 per, uh, 12 percent of damping for the diamond cross bracing because diamond cross bracing could help the infill walls to be in the in frame. Uh, if there is uh, just I told you if there is deficiency in the torsional behavior, this will this strengthening technique will help the infill wall to be stand in the frame. If they stand in the frame, the interaction, the interface between the infill walls and the reinforced concrete elements will be well enough to dissipate much more energy than expected. Yes, what we have done in the theoretic part, theoretical part of the study is to develop a new methodology. The new methodology for quantifying the damping relations of the infill frames or the reinforced concrete frames, the Jacobsen uh, convergence, Jacobsen method, is a kind of method that helps us to quantify the damping. Actually, this uh, damping validation needs to be verified with another uh, method. Well, uh, we have performed uh, and we have developed a new method 
to determine the damping. Let's see here that there is a flow chart to understand the damping mechanisms and to understand the energy dissipation mechanisms of the structures. Here you see the equation of motion and when we integrate it with the displacement we receive the energy components. Let's say here is the kinetic energy, strain energy and uh, the damping energy and hysteretic energy. At the right hand side it is the input energy. Okay, when we start iteration, we give the, uh, some values to the damping values. We need to satisfy this equation because the left hand side must be equal to the right hand side. There's no way, there's no other chance to, uh, that, to satisfy this equation. This equation should be satisfied by giving different damping values to this uh, equation. And when the, these equations are satisfied, when they are equal, yes, this equivalent, I mean the equivalent uh, damping coefficient is the correct damping coefficient for that structure. This is the main idea that we have performed, uh, that we have developed in energy equivalent, equivalent energy method. This method is uh, the one that we have developed uh, in comparison with the Jacobsen method. Here we can understand the energy terms. In the red one, we can see the summation of the kinetic energy, elastic energy, and the damping energy. The difference between the blue one and the red one gives us directly the hysteretic energy. This hysteretic energy term is direct measure of a damage. But we cannot say that the damping energy is not a direct measure of a damage. When we increase the part of the damping energy, we decrease the part of hysteretic energy. It means that we decrease the damage and we supply uh, the structure to survive from the credible earthquakes. We can understand that in the bare frame, this is the case of bare frame, almost 8% uh, of damping satisfies the energy. However, for the, uh, the, this one is the, also the bare frame, but for this infield frame, 11% uh, of equivalent damping is enough to satisfy the energy terms to be balanced together. As you see, when you give 11% uh, to the infill frames for the determination of the damping energy terms, the blue one is more or less in the same way with the black one. So, as you remember, we determined about 12% or 13% for the infill frames regarding with the damping values. In this way, in the equivalent energy terms, equivalent energy components, when we derive the energy discretization, we determine 11%. Almost same damping values were, def uh, were determined by using another method, which is developed in our study. This is one another case for the retrofitted frames. This one is the cross, diamond cross brace frame, which, we, which was determined about 10% of damping. And this one is the cross brace frame, is equal to the cross brace frame, which gives us 12% of damping. This one is the diamond cross brace frame, is actually gives us 12% of damping. Diamond cross bracing frame uh, type uh, retrofitting style sustains a good packaging property into the structure because when you make uh, this kinds of uh, retrofitting with CFRP material you can put the infill wall in the frame reinforced concrete frame much more safely than those the other uh, retrofitting uh, techniques this techniques is the most reasonable technique that determines us to under, uh, that determines uh, a 
good uh, packaging uh, property to the reinforced concrete structures. Then after all this uh, information, it will be easy to answer these questions. What are the names of the energy components? What is the idea behind finding the damping by equivalent energy method? In which part of the energy component do the infills affect? The second part of the study will be uh, composed of the theoretical study. Actually, in the theoretical study, we have performed the relations between the ductility and the damping. Because when we look at the literature, what's going on in the literature, there is a highly increase in the uh, damping properties of the reinforced concrete structures uh, and shear walls or infill frames. There has been many proposals regarding with the damping property of the structure with the ductility of the structure. So we have to also uh, propose a new relation between the damping and the ductility of the system. But we have to determine what is ductility then. Okay, let's look here for the understanding the ductility and what we have done in the theoretical part of this study. At the left hand side we can see uh, the real system. This is single degree of freedom system. This has a force displacement demand as a bilinear curve. This, the first line is at the points of yielding displacement and yielding force. The second line goes to the ultimate displacement versus ultimate force. When we combine this, we can propose an equivalent elastic system at the right hand side. We say that when we combine the two points from origin to the ultimate displacement and ultimate force, we can assume an equivalent stiffness values. Uh, accordingly, we can assume an equivalent damping to the system. So, what we can do is, if we have a single degree of freedom and if we know the nonlinear properties of this system, we can propose an equivalent system at the, like at the right hand side with the same mass properties, with the same mass properties, uh, we can propose a linear system with the K effective, let's see here, K uh, double E uh, double F, and with an equivalent damping coefficient C E double F. It's really easy to determine the, non, uh, determine the response of the single degree of freedom without making any more uh, complicated calculations. In order to uh, perform nonlinear dynamic time history analysis, you can perform linear dynamic time history analysis by using the equivalent stiffness and equivalent damping. In the study, the main idea of the theoretical part of the study to propose an equivalent stiffness and equivalent damping regarding with the ductility because the ductility is much important point to be understood in this study because you don't you cannot assume uh, uh, ultimate displacement and you you have to uh, determine the yielding displacement so if there is one ductility level if there is a uh, target ductility level you can understand the delta max over delta y. Otherwise, if there is no ductility, you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot understand the nonlinear behavior of the uh, element or a single degree of freedom system. In the literature, there has been many proposals for the damping of the system. Equivalent damping is regarded with the uh, first one is the elastic damping. This term is the plastic or elastoplastic damping. Regarding with the mu coefficient, it's a, it represents the ductility of the system. Another study proposes a 5% plus uh, this term of the uh, structure 
it means that uh, the elastic part of the infill frame is 5%, but of course there is a uh, dissipation damping contribution from the infill walls and it comes to this uh, equation. What we have done is determining the damping by Jacobsen method, but we have to define the Jacobsen method as we have per, uh, defined before. We already know this. And we need to know the, what is ductility. Ductility is the ratio of the system, uh, the this maximum displacement to the yielding displacement. Let's see here in the graphic. In the vertical part, it's the base shear. In the lateral part, it's the displacement. When you divide, when we divide the D, D max, delta max, to delta y, we can observe the ductility. Ductility means uh, the capability of the structure to make displacement, or the softness, uh, the actually the the capability of the structure to make a displacement. This is called as the ductility of the, uh, at least a uh, single degree of freedom system. How about stiffness? We have to define it. Uh, the force displacement relation is the right here. The longitudinal part is load and the lateral part is top displacement. There is two distinct points here, one in the positive direction and one in the negative direction. When we combine it with the red color, red line, the angle of the, this red line gives us the stiffness. This is called as the second stiffness in the literature. Let's say it's F max minus F min in negative Mars uh, divided by delta max minus delta min in the uh, other side. We get the stiffness of the structure. We can assume the stiffness uh, of the structure uh, by using some graphics that we'll, I will show you in uh, this lecture. The equivalent damping versus ductility is, re uh, is determined by our uh, experimental study. These curves represent our uh, experiments that have been uh, performed in quasi-static manner for the infill frame. This is the average value of the damping versus ductility relation. This one is the damping uh, versus ductility relation derived for the cross-braced frame. And this is the average value of the cross-braced frame. And lastly, the equivalent damping versus ductility is uh, determined for the diamond cross-braced frame. And this one is the, back uh, the average uh, curve determined for the diamond cross-braced frame. Yes, these are uh, the, the different techniques have yielded the sim similar uh, graphics. Yes, this graphic is much more important than those that we can observe all in one. Now, if you see that at the first uh, slide I showed uh, a proposal coming from the literature about the reinforced concrete frames or infiltrate reinforced concrete frames. And when you see the blue ones and the green ones, these are the ones that we have derived from our experiments. It's reasonable that there are infill walls contribution almost double, 5% damping. It's very initial. It, when uh, there is no any uh, serious damage in the structure be beyond one, one ductility, it means the elastic delta max is equal to delta y. There's no yielding or the, the, the maximum displacement is at the level of the yielding displacement. This curve shows us that the, it's reasonable and it's compatible with the literature. Okay. Now, if you say that the <coughs> for the cross brace frame, if we can observe this red line, and for the diamond cross brace frame, if we can observe the red line like this, and it is very uh, in a, a adjacent between the uh, literature, we can say that we, all, we can observe, we can prefer a, a good relation between the ductility and damping. If one goes aims at ductility, we can, you can use these uh, curves to identify the damping value of the system. 
It's very important information for designers to perform linear time story analysis than nonlinear time story analysis. This graphic gives us the stiffness ratio of the, uh, of the uh, retrofitted structure, retrofitted frame. Uh, when uh, the target value is determined about 1%, you can go to this graphic and check that the stiffness ratio to K to K0 means the initial stiffness. You can get 0 0.2 uh, ratio for determining the stiffness properties of the structure. How about the cross, diamond cross brace frame? When uh, the same graphic can be uh, quantified for the diamond cross brace frame, this, in this case, you can also t predict the uh, stiffness ratio uh, for the diamond cross brace frame for 1% of drift ratio. If one wants to make a design to, hit, uh, to the structure and if there is a target displacement level, you can observe the stiffness ratio by, giving, uh, by entering this graphic to get the stiffness ratio of the structure. And after all, after all, I can, we can show that there is an assumption in the stiffness of the structure by using the graphics that I give you here. And there is an uh, assumption for the damping properties of the structure by taking a ductility level. There are two important graphics that I propose here. You can use by estimating the Damp equivalent damping and equivalent stiffness. When you use equivalent stiffness with the elastic behavior, you do not need to perform a nonlinear dynamic time history analysis. Just per per performing a linear time history analysis by using uh, just one curve, it's enough to determine the response of the system. Here we see that the the uh, dotted lines are uh, compatible with the continuous lines that uh, we can assume by uh, the restoring force of the single degree of freedom system by performing a very easy method. This method is uh, very easy to be applied. Uh, be, uh, when, uh, besides, you, are, uh, you can perform, uh, you don't need to perform the plastic hinge theory, you don't need to make sectional analysis, or you don't need to assign some plastic hinges through the structures. Just what you need to do is you have to uh, determine, you have to understand the stiffness of the structure and the ductility level of the structure. Uh, the drift ratio, if you aim at drift, target drift ratio, you can assume a stiffness. If you uh, think about, that if you uh, say something about the ductility of the structure, you can go directly to the damping of the structure. From these two important informations, you can assume uh, equivalent stiffness and you can perform linear time history analysis and get these kinds of good relations with, without making any effort, without may, uh, performing any uh, sophisticated non-linear dynamic time history analysis. After all this, I think these questions are easy to be answered. Define stiffness. How much damping at least increase in the level of one ductility level? Define the effective stiffness. Now we will be talking about our study's conclusions. Actually, the infill walls are a great source of damping to the structure to the reinforced concrete structures. They, are, they have a high energy dissipation capability. They, survive, they could survive the structure from credible earthquakes. It is just the reason that uh, why the, some vulnerable reinforced concrete structures didn't uh, collapse uh, after the earthquake shocks is that the infill walls contributed them, supported them to resist uh, in terms of the earthquake uh, accelerations. It is the case that the infill walls contribute too much, at least, at least in the elastic part double, to dissipate their energy so they could survive during the earthquake. The conclusions uh, should is determined by various experiments from our studies performed in ITU. The uh, 
uh, these tests <coughs> are compatible to each other, even if their technique different with they perform with di different testing technique. The half of them tested with quasi-static manner, and the rest of them perform with the pseudo-dynamic test te uh, test technique. But all gives the same results, so that the information that we have derived from here can be generalized in the real life. We could uh, say that the diamond cross brace frame has 70% much more ductility than those others and 80% much more energy dissipation capacity than those others. Because the, when you apply the uh, retrofitting technique, if, even if there is a torsional effect in the reinforced concrete, the infill wall doesn't move out of plane and remains in its plane, so dissipates the energy by contacted, contacting with the reinforced concrete and their cells. The first diagonal cracking position was observed in the much more later levels uh, in terms of displacement in the in the case of uh, diamond cross brace phrasing te retrofitting technique, this is an effective technique and uh, reasonable technique uh, to determine and to supply a good sustainable ductility to the structure. How about equivalent damping values? The equivalent damping values is uh, that uh, is given to the structure by the infill walls and it is sustained by the retrofitting techniques. When you have 5% in the elastic part in the reinforced concrete bare frames, you could observe 13% in the infill frames. And if you make retrofitting, this value is kept constant during the earthquake. This is the much more, ca the much more important case uh, than the others that we can uh, package the infill frame to the RC uh, infill wall to the RC frames, and we could uh, observe we could uh, develop a new uh, uh, equivalent damping determination method. This method is based on the energy dissipations and energy equations. As we remember that the left hand side of the equation of motion is the energy portions and the right hand side is the energy input. If the energy input does not satisfy the energy components, there's a problem here. What, what we have to do is to make the balance with giving different values to the equivalent damping values. When we give about 13%, the energy terms and the energy balance equation is satisfied. So it's directly known that 13% is an acceptable damping value for the infield frames and uh, it is guaranteed by application of CFRP retrofitting technique. The infill walls dissipate at least 20% of the infill uh, input energy. And <coughs> the ductility versus damping relations shows that the 1% ductility of infill walls had 10% of equivalent damping. So 10% is not a uh, bad uh, damping level. Uh, uh, just the opposite, opposite is an, a good uh, damping level to the reinforced concrete structures. And what the retrofitting technique of CFRP uh, supplied us is that they guaranteed 1% drift during the earthquake. They limit the structure not to make much more displacement in, during the earthquake. Uh, the uh, reinforced concrete structures were strengthened with the CFRP sheets and the, she the amount of the CFRP sheets is enough to limit the displacement demand of the structure to be stayed in the 1% drift level. After all this, we can answer these questions. What's the most important effect of the CFRP application? How does the damping effect by the CFRP application? What is the percentage of the damping energy to be dissipated? This is the end of our lecture. If you have any question, please refer to the website. Thank you for your attention. Goodbye.